Let me follow up on a, a couple of points you made. Um, and given your experience with the United States Coast Guard before coming to DHS Chief Running as Support Officer, um, you know, I think that this is uh, going to remain true. Uh, COVID-19 uh, was a great example of, I'll call it an outside event that was not predicted, hitting the United States, um, and DHS having to very quickly mobilize resources, processes, people across diverse components um, to address uh, PPE in this case or other infrastructure uh, safety requirements. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, the uh, positives and negatives of how DHS has historically done this, being underutilized, under under resourced, uh, and the ability to you know bring these components together and processes together quickly to address the challenge. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple things. Uh, there's many different challenges across DHS. I think 250,000 people in, in um, but uh, I, I what I've learned, uh, and I've only been uh, I think a six month mark was just this week. Uh, one thing I've learned is uh, each component brings different talent levels. And there, uh, in essence, there's always one or two components that does something very well. Okay, and it could, it could, it could be PPE, how do you distribute PPE? It could be, it could be uh, Eric Brown, uh, you know, vehicles or, you know. It, so when the crisis comes, I, I think what, what, what I feel like is, is a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, DHS is recognized um, as, a, as a critical agency for, for the United States government. So you do get attention from, you get, if you get $178 million from PP, that's a, that's a really good thing. So it's right off the bat, you have that. Second, internally um, is, uh, and, and I, I think when I talked to my guys in LIO, a logistics integration office, and they were setting it up, there was somebody in CBP, uh, Customs and Border Protection, who had figured the whole thing out. And then, so they sat down with person in Customs and Border Protection and at least got port working you know and and i'm sure there are other experts out there but but my my thing is uh um one um is, is the is the reputation that dhs has but two um we've had components at uh, doing different types of law enforcement missions or whatever missions for a long long time and they're very very good at it and no matter what we're doing whether it's real property or covid 19 ppe what, what we're really trying to do is just take the shining light and bring everybody up back uh, up together with a shining light, I guess the best way to put it. Uh, Eric or Al, uh, any other perspectives regarding that question of how, uh, you know, DHS or, or the components of ICE were able to mobilize, uh, you know, very uniquely to address, in this case, it was PP requirements? Well, in my case, uh, you know, we, we dealt with sanitization across the department. Um, and of course, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, probably. Um, but, you know, the questions were coming from the field, not just from the fleet management offices or for the components, uh, property offices of how do we decontaminate our vehicles? <laughs> we still have to do our operations. I mean, we didn't get into the PPE in my section very much. Of course, I was familiar with PPE working from ICE and then coming to headquarters. However, um, you know, we had to give them guidance on what to do. And, you know, we create, you know, my office created a document at least to put out at a department level, which was in line with CDC guidelines on how to decontaminate vehicles because the law enforcement folks still had to do their job. As, as Ken mentioned, you know, the, the criminals don't stop. Uh, they might, some of them might go sit down while the, you know, COVID's going on, but they're, they're still doing criminal things. Uh, investigations still have to continue. Uh, detainees still have to be transported. So, you know, there's, PPE requirement for that, and then how do you decontaminate the vehicle after? So yeah, we, it, it's been busy. It's been busy. The past six, seven months have been extremely busy. Hey, this is Al. At the onset of uh, COVID-19, when I got the phone call from the chief financial officer uh, directing me to be the, uh, the point of contact for ICE component, uh, I didn't realize what he was putting me into. At the very beginning, it resulted in uh, being able to care for 20,232 uh, ICE personnel, uh, the major portion of that being law enforcement officers, about 7,500, and the rest being um, uh, non-law non enforcement. Also, uh, at the very beginning, uh, there was uh, very little structure, and Ken already mentioned this, but uh, a uh, red team was put together under uh, Robert King at DHS and uh, I was part of that team and um, 
we actually showed what we were doing with our weekly report because at the very onset, we didn't really have, a, 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 it was, everything was so decentralized when it came to PPE. So by getting a weekly uh, report, we showed that to DHS as a potential adoption. They, I think they used some of it, but uh, the report actually turned out to be a very good tool uh, managed by DHS and being able to put in those requirements. And uh, what I found in ICE is that uh, I had to set up a, a logistic structure, uh, not only uh, myself, but I had to have two acquisition uh, senior advisors to add to the team. Uh, DHS allowed us to have a primary, which was myself, and then two uh, other individuals that would deal on the biweekly meetings with, uh, with the pandemic uh, team from DHS. And um, I can, I'd just like to put kudos out for both uh, Jama and uh, Mr. Uh, Diego Garcia. Uh, they did great in supporting uh, ICE requirements. And other, uh, the fact that initially when we started out, the uh, structure was very, uh, there was really no structure. I had to develop that. So developed uh, for the 270 locations, I have five primary uh, programs within ICE and I have five main contacts for uh, for point of contact for PPE, but on top of that, there's 270 locations that we have uh, not only domestic but international that had to be taken care of. And one of the uh, challenges that we initially had was that, for example, the U.S. embassies and the U.S. mail was actually shutting down in many of the locations uh, because there was either no flights going into those countries or else uh, people were staying home. So uh, initially the orders uh, went into DHS around the March, April timeframe. And then we started receiving our first PPE in July. And uh, DHS worked out some wonderful things on being able to get us some KN95s and KN90s from FEMA, which worked out very well. and supplemented our cloth face masks that we were using, some face shields and goggles. And then uh, next came the, uh, the 9205 respirators, which uh, was mentioned, we get about 333,000 uh, every month for the next 12 months for a total of about 4 million. And again, at the very onset of, of, of uh, COVID-19, DHS, along with all the other federal agencies, uh, were, in were really not in competition, but uh, the health and medical and first responders were getting um, almost everything. And uh, so we had to kind of wait in turn for, for that to develop for us to be able to get something um, either from the national stockpile or, or for the vendors to be, get to a point with the production that could start providing to the federal agencies. And as of this month, uh, uh, like Ken mentioned before, uh, all those orders that we did in phase one are all starting to come in at the same time. And so with people still uh, in phase one and trying to reconstitute to phase two for the COVID-19 to bring at least uh, 25 to 50% of the employees back to work, which, uh, uh, unfortunately, it, it seems like we're spiking again in many of the areas. Uh, we can't bring our people. Every time we try to bring them in, someone gets uh, COVID-19, and then we have to uh, reduce back down again. So, again, we're getting pretty saturated on PP&E. Uh, I think that's a wonderful thing, but we're also having to expand our storage. We're also trying to divert from our locations directly to our warehouse that we have in Maryland. And... Uh, we're doing quite well right now, and, and we're actually looking at our risk assessment to uh, reassess that to ensure that we have to take a look at the different phases uh, that occur. I mean, we're talking about phase one where it's up to 25%, phase two is up to 50%, and phase three basically to get everybody back to where we were before pre-COVID-19. So uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, initially, it was very challenging. Uh, I like uh, DHS with Jamie, I know it cannot be done without having a, a great team behind you. And um, it's, it's really worked pretty well for us. Excellent. Thank you, Al. Ken, uh, any, any last thoughts to add uh, before we shift to general discussion outside of PPE? No, I, I actually have to run, but I, I really appreciate the uh, chance to talk. And uh, I appreciate the subject too. Um, and being new, like real property was kind of tough. We're COVID-19 PP is certainly not expert, but I've, but I've been living the dream like everybody else, like Al and Erica uh, with the COVID-19 PP. It's, it's really important. And uh, I, uh, like Al mentioned, it was tough getting going just because what you're competing against uh, with the medical community, for instance, where, where it should be. Um, but it's, 
but it's but it's been a, a great learning experience and a great uh, collaboration across the department and uh, when we're dealing with uh, across other agencies. Every, everybody has been very collaborative. It's it's actually a good news story and, and what could have been a very bad news story. I think so. Yeah, very good. Well, Ken, thank you uh, for your presentation and for the work that you're doing you. over in logistics. Okay, appreciate Thanks. It. Thanks, bye -bye. Yeah, thanks for kind words on ice. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Keep them straight, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> he always does. <laughs> He's fine. Working on it. All right. Uh, we'll we'll shift to some of the uh, more general questions. This one we we've, we've covered a little bit with uh, COVID nineteen, but I think that there there's been a lot that has happened since the symposium. Uh, you know, almost a year ago. Uh, on top of COVID nineteen, social unrest. Uh, dynamic outside threats, uh, you know, from new new state actors and cyber threats. Um, how has asset management changed uh, for the law enforcement community over this time? Um, you know, given uh, what the the country is going through and, and the outside actors. You want me to go first? Go for it. So, um, in my opinion, um, so first of all, from the operational side, I can't speak to. Uh, on what the department does operationally. And, and I, I dare to even dive into that. However, from the, op, uh, from the, from the support side, uh, all of our leadership, uh, when it comes to social unrest and those kind of things, are sensitive to that. And they, they've told us and to, in all of our dealings to, to be sensitive to that because uh, some of the complaints are extremely legitimate. Uh, and, and we need to take into consideration uh, the climate of the country when we, you know, when we when we think about doing our business and who we're actually supporting as a department. Um, terrorist threats to handle. Uh, that's the operational side. I don't really get into that. Uh, I, I have my feelings about it, of course, um, but I let the uh, let the operators that respond to those things do so accordingly. How things have changed since last year? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> when we sat down last, was it November? We had no, no, no idea how uh, COVID would be impacting uh, how we do business across the board. Um, and then, of course, when it, when it really hit us in March, you know, it, it, it took a big impact. But I'll say this, to, to, I said that to say this, law enforcement support has not stopped. Nothing has stopped other than a few things, but for the most part, giving support to the department and law enforcement has not stopped. Uh, I've been in this house since March 12th. The work has not stopped. My people have not stopped supporting the mission. Uh, across the board, uh, the inventories were still getting completed. Nothing has stopped. Where the, where the law enforcement officers and agents need their equipment, it's been there. Uh, servicing their equipment, is still being done availability still being done. So all of those things, uh, it, only, it only impacted us by where we do business, not necessarily how we do business because a good percent of our business within the logistics realm, specifically in property and fleet is uh, technically done online. It's done virtually, it's done by email. You know, now we have Zoom meetings, we have team meetings. We, have, we, still, don't, we still meet, we just don't meet in a specific building or a specific office. Um, We've partnered with a, a bunch of people that we had no idea we'd ever need to partner with. Um, sanitization of vehicles, I mentioned that earlier. Um, we had to, I created some guidelines based on CDC uh, guidance and submitted that to all the fleet managers throughout the department because one of the things that, of course, was not, it's a, even though it's a safety and health issue, they've come into CRSO for how to use desan desanitize your vehicle or or, or your build, buildings and stuff. We, we're not experts at sanitization, but we've become experts at sanitization because we had to read the guidance and we had to put out something. So from the facility side, I really can't talk to it, but I do know that there's been guidance submitted to all uh, facilities managers across the department on what is needed to be done. Of course, a new technology is constantly coming out. The, the, the document that I created for vehicle sanitization was again, based on CDC guidelines, because at the end of the day, uh, most of us have vehicles. You look at the owner's manual, tell you how to clean the seats and all that kind of stuff. But that's not the same thing. Uh, Ford Motor Company, we partnered with them uh, through S&T, not, not CRSO, but through S&T Science and Technology. 
um, there was a study done with Ford Motor Company, and I want to say it was University of uh, Michigan, or I don't remember what school it was. However, they came up with an app for Ford Interceptor vehicles, and it's go. I think it's from 2013 to present. Um, that app allows only Ford interceptors right now to be heated up to 133 degrees and you leave it on for 15 minutes and that sanitizes the vehicle. Wow. So, you know, when you have information like that, it's not just good to know, you uh -huh. need to get it out there. So one of the things that through our normal fleet management council, we put that information out and we said, don't just keep it to yourselves, get it to the field, get it to the operators. The app is free to a federal and state and local law enforcement. All they have to do is go to the dealer and get it installed. Um, it may cost, but it may not. I mean, that's the individual dealership part. But at the end of the day, that's the method to do it. Ford Motor Company also, <laughs> through this study, uh, said that you could leave it in the sun for a while too. <laughs> That'll do the same thing. So if you don't want to pay for the app, if you're not using the vehicle, park it in the sun, allow the sun to do its job. Um, and you leave it in the sun for you know a few hours and it's likely sanitized especially on hot days. And most of our stuff is on the Southwest border. So it, that's no problem there to decontaminate right. vehicle if you want to uh, use that method. So, I mean, there's, there's a few things that have been going on over since the you know, COVID period kicked in, but again, partnerships. But I do want to stress um, that no, no law enforcement organization within the department has suffered, not at all. Um, yeah, the mission continues. Yeah, and, and you know, one thing to add to that, Eric, I, I think the the workload has only increased, um, you know, from I think from everybody uh, that's that's <laughs> dealing with this response. So it's not just that it's stay, it's uh, hasn't deteriorated; it has actually increased. And I know that it's more of a twenty four seven operation now. Um, just you know, given the needs uh, and the mission, the dedication of the people of uh, Homeland Security. So one of the things, you know, I talk about uh, my commute time is less. I live 18 minutes from my job, um, but a commute can take anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, depending on the day. Yeah. And, and, and me personally, I know a lot of people don't, but I park when I, when I drive to DC. So I'm actually saving time and money being home. However, they're getting their money's worth out of me now. <laughs> I, 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 log, I, may, I log in at seven in the morning and, and, and pretty much stay on until like six. And then throughout the evening, if I get something, I respond to it. I don't like to have things sitting around. So not just doing the normal logistics stuff and the property and fleet stuff that I do. Uh, of course, all our personnel stuff, all of those other things that come along with, with, with doing this job. So it, again, I, I emphasize it does not stop. And it has increased a little bit. Yeah, and I think that, you know, hopefully when we get through this, we'll do an after action analysis and say, well, how can we set ourselves up even in the remote uh, environment more effectively mm -hmm. so as to be able to you know work that eight hours and then control uh, you know the the other asks that come in right and they may yeah. be coming in through instant message and text message and email and you know just landline so I think that that's a little lesson learned yeah we're in um, constant contact I'll find I'll, I'll leave my phone upstairs now sometimes <laughs> <laughs> that's right Al uh, did you want to share your perspective on how asset management Management has changed uh, the law enforcement community on your side. Yeah, uh, I just want to agree with Eric uh, that law enforcement never stood down. I think earlier I said there was like 7,500 uh, law enforcement, but there's actually over 13,000 law enforcement out of that 20,232. The rest are non-law enforcement. And most of the ones that, that are re working remotely are administrative staff workers, which are the non-LEOs. And those law enforcement are still out on doing their day and night jobs. They're still out there uh, very active uh, doing so. One of the uh, examples I wanted to provide today is, is the fact that the personal property uh, has this requirement to do an annual fiscal inventory every single year. And ICE has over 208,000 assets on record. And I um, have a, a, a young uh, uh, chief property management unit, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Porsche Porter. She actually uh, worked with her team uh, come on and, and uh, Miss Hunter to develop a, a virtual inventory by using mobile phones, taking pictures of barcodes and worked out a template and was able to complete 
100% of the inventory this year in a virtual environment, which for me is a first. And being a consulting fellow for the National Property Management Association, Eric would probably agree with me that this would make a great article for the uh, property magazine on uh, something working in a virtual environment. So it just goes to show you uh, what can be done, uh, what even if there's a challenge that, that the staff can raise up to that challenge and take, take it on and be able to uh, develop a, uh, a scheme and a plan in order to uh, take care of a requirement. And that requirement uh, uh, got us to a point that we could actually uh, respond before 30 September to the department. So it was a great job in a virtual environment in a pandemic world. That's exceptional work. And, and I think a great best practice to share across the law enforcement community and, and executing that. So, so to add to what Al was saying, and of course, definite kudos to Al uh, Camon Fabrier and Porsche Porter for, for doing this. Um, some of my protégés, kind of, I guess. <laughs> but, but at the end of the day, uh, the virtual environment was extremely challenging. And, um, you know, there was a public law that came up a couple of years ago, 115, 419, where, you know, it, it kind of relaxed the requirement for inventory by just dealing with cap assets or capitalized assets. Um, but, you know, at the department, we have a, a more stringent, we, we dig a little deeper because we have so many sensitive assets and assets that are uh, into uh, equipment class codes that we just want to make sure that we capture properly. So of course, that, that's what Al is talking about, the annual requirement for 100% inventory. But you know, it does allow for uh, electronic uh, verification. Um, if, if, if I am issued a phone or a computer, uh, somebody runs a, a report that says Eric Brown logged into that computer, chances are Eric Brown's <laughs> got that computer. So we just do a verification. So there's so many different methods other than physically just touching it to ensure that uh, that the asset is there and, and who has it. Um, so, you know, it's supposed to be reported loss if you've lost it, if you do it doing your job properly because you need another computer or another phone if you've lost a, a damaged one. Um, but an electronic verification is great, a great method to, to, to uh, supplement the physical touch of an actual, actual asset. So thank you again. Excellent. Uh, move on to the, the, the next question uh, related to ISO 55,000. As 55,000 uh, practitioners, we know that the ultimate goal is to drive value within an organization. Um, so I uh, wanted to know, you know, what does value mean to law enforcement asset management? And has that changed uh, over time? So from my point of view, um value to the law enforcement community. They want what they want and they need what they need. Uh, it goes back to the facilities must be there. Uh, it's, and I think I, I, I saw 55,000 uh, more points to the availability and the accountability and the property management systems uh, all related uh, to uh, value, right? So value to the agent, to the officers and agents though means that uh, the assets are there and they're in working condition. Uh, be it a building, be it a phone, be it a gun, be it a car. Um, as long as we're maintaining and, and keeping track of this stuff uh, and making sure that it's properly maintained and doing those things, of course, there's some of them things, some of those things they're responsible for themselves, but um, we just want to make sure that we account for everything that they need and to bring value to them. Um, I, I will guess just having it, having it there when they need it. Um, uh, we, we have people um, a hell of a lot smarter than I am that handle facilities, both the department and the components um, that make sure that their consolidated buildings are you know, available, that the buildings are serviceable. Um, of course, then we have mandates to freeze the footprint or reduce the footprint of a particular agency or, or the government as a whole uh, for efficiency purposes. So again, to meet those needs of, of those law enforcement folks across the board, I think it's still critical whether we reduce or not. Um, and again, availability, I think, is is that term that I would use use uh, on on a, as, you know across the board if it's available. This is, uh, to what, them. One of the things that we're looking at, and uh, for my asset management division, is trying to uh, develop a AM what I call AMD strategic plan. 
and also uh, to eventually lead to a possible certification of ISO 55000 in asset management. And uh, developing a five-year plan uh, that captures four main ingredients. Uh, one is to capture and realize the value of assets through the application of best practice of asset management principles that enable ICE mission fulfillment. The second one is to establish a framework to guide the management of assets through aligned roles, responsibilities, policies, and objectives. And third is to establish a governance structure to ensure employees, data, and tools are the best capable for the assigned tasks. And then fourth and final is to ensure a culture of stewardship of asset management resources, maximize utilization, and minimize waste. If I can get those four things done in five years, then uh, we'll be further ahead. <laughs> Always looking for seeking improvement in yeah. uh, in the value for for our uh, customers. You need to share that with us, Al. Yes, sir. Um, and one of our uh, attendees did pose the question. I, I, I think it's a very good one. Uh, thinking of value as the the end stakeholder, and that's the, you know the American public. Um, and there they point out you know, value being derived as the intangible truth of justice in the American way. Um, you know, are you able to tie the, the value that's delivered to, I, I would say your internal customers, which are the officers and agents that are uh, executing the law enforcement mission all the way down to um, you know, safeguarding uh, the American public from uh, outside threats, acts of terrorism, as well as domestic violence. I think the, this is Al. I think the best way to answer that is is that uh, we all have strategic uh, goals and objectives, and uh, I have uh, not only with uh, the chief chief financial officer, but we have the management and uh, administration strategic goals. We have the ICE uh, strategic goals as well as DHS strategic goals. Those all tie into uh, protecting the American public um, against uh, a variety of uh, threats and. Uh, and that's what we build off. Actually, what I'm building my AMD uh, strategic plan off of is, is tying into all those different values and uh, to protect. Very good. Now, Eric, if there's a, that doesn't answer the question, maybe there'd be a follow up. Thank yeah. you. So, you know, one of the things with that CRSO is called uh, being prepared with affordable readiness. And <laughs> that's the CRSO uh, tagline. And, and being ready is, is what we do. I mean, the CRSO uh, is one of the uh, key management functions within the department that uh, handles all logistics, you know, um, facilities, uh, asset logistics, and the, the, uh, Ken mentioned the logistics and the integration office. Um, yeah, I, I just think being, being ready as a department uh, to handle all things and give the public the confidence that they need. I mean, the, you know, you talk about domestic terrorism and all of the things that fall into that category. Um, CRSO is just, again, trying to make sure that the things are available to those components and we support the components any way we can to make sure that they are operational, operationally ready. Um, domestic terrorism and all of those different things that, that, that's, that's handled at a department level from the operation side, like ICE, Secret Service, CBP. Um, but again, we have to make sure that, you know, we talk about truth in the American way, you know, giving the public confidence that we're doing what we're supposed to do and the agents can do what they're supposed to do. Yeah, very good. Uh, and, and Eric, I, on this next question, um, I'm really fascinated to hear your response given uh, experience at ICE and then moving to, to the purview of the department. So you get seeing across all the different components uh, given purview across national locations, uh, what are some of the benefits and challenges to managing assets as a system over the past year? <laughs> You're still on mute, Eric, so. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Yeah, I, I put myself on mute for a reason. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, systems, one of the things that we do face is, as a department right now is systems. Um, and it's not necessarily the fact that one component uses one system versus another using, you know, there's SAP, it's CBP, there's Sunflower and other components. And a system challenge to me has always been, and even, even Ken talked about the logistics machine, like they had there at, at, at his uh, logistics center in, in Baltimore. 
I, and I think I mentioned this last year and, and I will preach it until that Holy Grail is found. Um, there's, there's no one system that does it all um, with the same regularity for acquisitions, um, accountability, um, you know, procurement. You, you have a good property system that might do accounting. You have a good property system uh, that might do procurement. You have a financial system that, that might do finance and procurement, but then each system, you will never find one that does all three with the same regularity. I mean, one may have to be modified to, to, to fit. Um, but I think that's even, even, even at, at Sunflower, when I was at ICE, um, the financial folks don't see it the same way as the property folks. There's, there's two audiences and there's two different languages. We, we try to tie it together, it doesn't always work. And, we, and at the department, it's pretty much the same thing. We, we're pulling, we're pulling uh, we have this system called CAPSIS uh, that pulls, it's a, basically a data warehouse that pulls data from across the department. And it, it's, it's our data warehouse where we get all of the information pulled into one system. And we're still struggling with uh, standardizing data so that we can talk apples to apples to each system we pull from. Uh, we have a data management committee that is, is working on that specifically. Uh, it's called, it's called MAP DMC, Mobile Asset Personal Property Data Management Committee. Um, and we have separate communities of interest set up to, to standardize that, that data and that information. But system-wise, if, if there was one thing that we could pull off the shelf and say, hey, this is it, I would love to see that before I retire. <laughs> I mean, there may, there may be some people and other people may have some input to say, hey, the our system does all of that. Yeah, but your system may do all of that, but is it the same level for each line of business? Is it the same level for procurement? And, you know, is it, and, and is it the same level for property and is it the same level for finance? Um, so that's, that's what I see at the department level. And, and it, it still hasn't changed. Even, even some of the best systems that have been in place for years had to be modified to do it. You, yeah. can't, just put, you can't just pull it off the shelf and say, this is it. Yeah, anything to add to that or shall I move to the next question? Okay, well, we'll move on to uh, some innovation questions. So how has technological innovation helped or hindered your ability to manage assets? Uh, what are some of the barriers to technological adoption, whether that's cultural, financial, security, or lack of a vendor base? I, yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, I'm one for innovation and being able to use uh, uh, devices that can ease the workload on my staff. Um, I think uh, one of the most recent uh, uh, devices is the uh, telematics device. Uh, we use it on a limited basis within ICE. We have one program that, that uh, is pushing to do over 4,000 vehicles uh, with telematics. They, they understand that it takes the manual uh, the operator out of the process and basically uh, use an de electronic device that can transmit the same information that, uh, that's required for us to report under the SAFE Act. Uh, DHS, Department of Homeland Security, is, when, uh, is the only uh, uh, applicant uh, of the uh, SAFE Act that has a requirement of five data elements that have to be tracked uh, based on congressional uh, law. And uh, I know Eric can speak more to that, but I think the telematics offers an opportunity uh, to increase our knowledge of, of utilization of the vehicles. And um, it takes the uh, staff out of the uh, in-between and the data can go directly in uh, from one system to another. Uh, again, like Eric said, it's not really integrated, but I think uh, it provides uh, an opportunity to be better. The other uh, innovative uh, thing that's been around for some time is the mobile phones. And I think, uh, uh, by instituting uh, apps utilizing mobile phones is, is a way to go with uh, for those operators that continue to provide data on their utilization of their vehicles, for example. And I think that uh, that way we can cover all the bases as we add apps. I know that the Office of uh, OCIO, Information Office, is, is trying to increase the number of apps that are available. It takes uh, six to nine months to actually go through all the security checks and everything. But I think that that's a, a 
that's going to be a common place in the future. I mean, uh, you can't go anywhere nowadays and not see somebody looking at a tablet or, or a mobile phone. So uh, I think uh, we're actually seeing uh, GPS devices within the vehicles now. There's all these capabilities that are available to use the workload. And I think uh, as asset managers, especially in the law enforcement environment, any, anything that we can do to take the administrative burden off of our law enforcement and non-law enforcement uh, officers is very critical for the success of, of ICE. Yeah, uh, that, you know, it's a, it's a great point, Al. Um, the technological innovation uh, and the advances in telematics or low frequency Bluetooth or RFID, they've been out there for years and we see the price point of these of this technology getting lower, or the adoptability um, being enhanced because you can now access it through mobile devices, um, whereas you know ten years ago it just that wasn't the case. Uh, what hurdles do you see um, in terms of adoption of these technologies? Uh, and I think part part of that question is by the time you adopt something, there's a new technology out there that has surpassed it. So you know, where are some examples that you've seen uh, in the past or some hurdles that you face that others uh, may be able to benefit from hearing about? So our biggest hurdle is telematics. And of course, thank you, Al, for speaking of that, because that was going to be my topic. <laughs> I wanted to make sure that we brought up telematics. Sure. Um, First of all, like Al said, the telematics is, relieves the uh, operator uh, from fingering in numbers, uh, fuel use, all of those different things. Telematics captures all of that. Um, so, so the administrative burden on the law enforcement agents and officers, they can take the time and go elsewhere and do something else. You know, keep, keep investigating. You don't have to log these things in. However, we do have uh, a, a segment of the department that will not use them. Uh, but those are, there were some security reasons that were brought up legitimately. Um, it's not just waved across the board. Everybody, the, 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 the CRSO requirement is all medium and light duty vehicles within the department will have telematics. We're close to being there. I would say CBP is one of the largest organizations and they're like 95% there now. Uh, they're just testing the remaining devices. And from, from now forward, CBP will be 100% as a department you know, 51,000 vehicles approximately. I would say out of those 51,000, 60% are law enforcement. Um, and the majority of them have telematics because they're leased. So telematics, we either have uh, have them installed one of two ways. There, there's a blanket purchase agreement uh, uh, that the department has stood up with three different vendors. Or if we're leasing the vehicles, they're coming from GSA. GSA has a telematic solution in place by a company called Geotab, which is actually one of our um, BPA vendors. And um, as vehicles roll out, because they're GSA owned, we're just leasing them. They're having telematics installed on them. Uh, how we do telematics is not necessarily from an administrative purpose. And I think we've had to hit that ball home several times to the law enforcement folks said, we're not trying to track your business. We only want to use vehicle, we only want vehicle utilization information. We only want mileage. We only want, you know, the things that uh, validate what we have called the SAVE Act. So the SAVE Act is public, what is it? Public law 115 dash, give me one second here. 115 38 uh, Stop Asset Vehicle Access Act. And it's only imposed on the Department of Homeland Security, no one else. So that's a law that tells us we have to provide the information for these vehicles to show utilization and, and do what we can to minimize the fleet where we can. Um, so we, we, we have those things in place to, to keep us on track. Uh, and again, because it's a law, it, it makes a difference. You have a law and you can't, and, and, and an agency or a component can't say, well, we're not gonna do, well, it's a law, you're violating the law if you don't do it. So it, we, don't, we don't have the, luxury of some other agencies where, you know, you can do it or not. And, uh, and, and, and I think the law enforcement community that we work with is understanding that we're not just doing this to, to get at you. We don't, you know, we don't care how many high speed pursuits you have, unless somebody within your organization cares. We just want to make sure that you're using the asset properly and that's available to you. Again, <laughs> availability is my thing. Uh, if, if you're using it properly and we're, we're tracking utilization, there's no way, um, at the end of the year or whenever we decide to do a vehicle allocation methodology or VAM, 
that you can say there's vehicles not being used. Um, and use translates into two different things. You know, you may be, you know, mileage and it may be uh, undercover. It may be uh, sitting on a border island, but you're still using it because that's the mission requirement. So yeah. I think we're good there. Yeah, a little passionate about that. That's, that, that's yeah, great. Yeah, a little bit, man. A little and bit. I, I, I do want to give a, a shout out. I know we've already uh, complimented ICE on the work they've done in the department, but I, I also hear GSA. You know, I know that was a monumental effort getting that telematics contract out there for the government to improve, uh, you know, leased vehicles and, and have it on hand as well as CBP for implementing the, the telematics on their side. So uh, on one note... Yeah. One note. One note on that too. Uh, of course, you know our our contract because uh, we were trying to get ahead of the curve on the executive order to to get telematics installed. I mean, we be in a department, so that's why it was opposed in 2017. Let's get these things done. Um, we had it tested uh, for security and, and mitigated any risk. Uh, we had a Volpe certification uh, a test on it, um, but the one for for GSA is FedRAMP, FedRAMP certified. And, you know, FedRAMP certification is not easy to get, just in case anybody doesn't know. But once you reach that FedRAMP certification, you're trusted across the federal government. So, you know, that the GeoTab device that they're installing now is FedRAMP certified. Excellent. Al, did you have anything uh, else to add to that? Uh, no, I, I think that covers everything. Yeah, that, that's that's excellent. I, and I think there's, you know, also uh, something you pointed out, Eric, that's, like a plus minus, right? So you have the SAVE Act there that has a lot of requirements that you know DHS might, uh, has to abide by. Um, and on one hand, you have the SAVE Act, so it was a forcing factor in a way for the adoption of telematics within the department, um, you know, uh, across agencies. Um, so there's, you know, there's a positive aspect, and then there's also the other requirements that come along with the SAVE Act. Um, on reporting and accountability and um, you know significant workload that the department and the components have to absorb. Um, so I think that's a fascinating case when you're looking at other law enforcement agencies across the federal department who haven't adopted some of this technological change um, you know, because they haven't had a forcing factor there uh, like DHS um, with the pluses and minuses that come along with that. Oh, Eric, you're on mute again. Sorry. No okay. problem. Thank you. So one of the first minuses that I can tell you is <laughs> there. They is is that uh, that no no person with fleet management responsibilities gets a bonus at all, and that's not necessarily just the fleet manager or the director of uh, mobile assets and personal property. That could be CRSO. That could be under secretary. So anybody that has <laughs> fleet management responsibilities by law, if you're not doing what you're supposed to do. Um, you you will be you will be notified so it's so to speak by not getting the bonus yeah that's just one thing um but the, the labor portion of it i don't think that's a big issue i mean i know we do more with less but the fact that we are using telematics makes that less i mean doing that more a lot easier um we, we we're still not ingesting all of the data as we we want just yet because we're still working through the kinks on on data transmission or uh, data ingestion primarily because each component has their own contract with our BPA. We, as a department, we don't own those contracts. So we have to work and get administrative rights for our data people to pull the data uh, to ingest. We're also working with CBP uh, to establish, uh, well, CBP has had an infrastructure uh, in place for several years at this point using the uh, Syntec fuel master system. And that fuel master system uh, as a bonus to, to up upgrading the infrastructure had telematics included. Um, so we're, we're actually receiving that data uh, on, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis, but as far as the, in, the telematics data, because they're also using what they call cellular devices, um, that is going to be a big bonus once we get all of that pulled at the same time from the same component and the same way from the same components. Just yeah. being able to pull all of that data, again, uh, it, it, it should relieve everybody or relieve all the operators in the field from having to do all of those reports. I remember when I was at ICE and, and the agents and the officers, they were completely tired of doing those reports and, you know, uh, submit fuel receipts. They still haven't probably do that, but they're, they're, I'm sure without, with, with telematics, it tells me how, how, much, how much fuel they use and how many miles they've driven, all of that kind of stuff. So it's a lot easier to pull and verify. 
Um, are there any non-technological innovations that you've seen within law enforcement asset management that you'd like to share? Good people. Mm. Good people. You, you know, fortunately, we just brought on a, a gentleman uh, at, at the department, Mr. Fabian Cardona. He was, he was, he's a former uh, Air Force person, uh, former consultant with Mercury and Associates. And uh, many of you in the fleet community know Mercury Associates. Um, but he has over, over 25 years of fleet management experience. Um, I think we've been fortunate enough in CRSO uh, to pull some good people that know some stuff. Uh, I, I, I was a federal contractor, of course, after I got in the military, I was a federal contractor for many years before I started with ICE. I learned a lot at ICE. I learned a lot as a contractor <laughs> and, 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 and it actually helped. It, it seems like each thing I've done has built on the next thing and the thing and, and pulling good people that have those same experiences kind of puts us in a better management perspective on how to do stuff. So that's the least uh, technological thing that you can do is bring on good people. Yeah, and all the innovation and knowledge that comes along with it. Definitely agree. Al, uh, anything else to share from your perspective on non-technological innovations? Uh, I'm sorry to say no, I don't have anything. I think uh, I, I don't really want to go into all the specifics. Uh, ISIS really trying to uh, uh, one major program and actually uh, a smaller program uh, to, to use telematics on their vehicles. Uh, there's still a little resistance from some of the law enforcement and there's reasons for that. I don't really want to go into you know, on this particular panel, but uh, Eric is aware of that. Uh, the department is aware of it. And uh, we keep trying to coach through the process and keep trying to educate uh, the law enforcement about uh, what uh, protections there are utilizing a telematics uh, device. And I think uh, it's kind of like on an iceberg with a toothpick kind of chipping away at it a little bit at a time. And, and eventually we'll get it down to where uh, we got everybody on the same pl uh, pl platform uh, utilizing a, a, you know, a device that's actually very good. And uh, again, eliminates that administrative burden that they're, they're uh, going through right now. So I think that that's uh, where we're heading. That's excellent. You know, um, we had a question or, or a statement um, that was posed to us here. And I, I think it's important because people often forget about the seized assets that, you know, law enforcement, um, you know, has to deal with as, as part of the job. Um, you know, how have you been able to apply these you know, ISO 55,000 management principles to how you address seized assets. Um, there, there's accountability issues, there's uh, process issues, inventory, cost to the taxpayer, uh, and it's a big problem. Yeah, I, so, I can. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, maybe I should let the department go first, Eric, <laughs> then I'll follow up. I mean, there's a there's a process for seized assets, and, and they go through uh, that same process across the board. Um, CBP is the organization that manages uh, seized assets for the department. All right, so you, whether it's detainee property um, that was abandoned or you know turned over during a, 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 a detention uh, that the uh, person that left the country did not want it or did not claim it. So, I mean, there's, there's still that whole adjudication process that has to go through for every um, asset. When you talk about seized assets, like seeds for drug busts, those kinds of things, same thing, it's managed by that organization. Some of those assets are actually turned into federal property, but at the end of the day, if they're not, they have to be sold and the money turned over to treasury. So that's pretty much all I got for that. I mean, seized, seized assets are, are just what they are. Yeah. Now, and I, yes, just to add to that, um, I think we average somewhere around maybe 10 seized vehicles a year. Um, once the courts uh, releases the vehicle to the federal government, then uh, before we actually accept that vehicle, we, we do a lot of cross checks to ensure 
that there is still utilization available on that vehicle and that we just don't accept uh, seize vehicles and add that to our inventory because we operate under what's called an open fleet profile that's approved by the DHS uh, uh, by Eric, actually his team, and then each year. So uh, when we look at that seize asset, we, we want to ensure that there is going to be some value to the organization and that's going to fit in. But we also, we're going to give up a, an equal vehicle of the same type. If it's like a four by four, we're going to give up a four by four uh, that has outstanding mileage. And actually, uh, usually on seized vehicles, we average anywhere from two to five additional years of usage of, of that particular vehicle. Uh, so it is, uh, becomes an asset. And I think that that falls right in line with uh, ISO 5500, you know, getting value for, for the organization. Excellent. All right. I think we're rounding out our, our questions here. Uh, so turning to uh, the standard, um, you know, how do you think that you know, ISO uh, 55,000 could be helpful to, to your organization? Al, you had already brought up strategic asset management planning, um, but are there, are there other things you'd like to share regarding how 55,000 can benefit DHS or, or, or ISO in particular? So I, I, I could say that, for example, ICE is uh, organized into multiple programs with different, uh, differing uh, priority functions and together, and all to achieve uh, their specific mission goals within their own programs and also for ICE and also for DHS. Specific needs within each program are unique to their individual missions with a common fundamental need of right of assets to the right place at the right time to support mission objectives. And ISO 5500, 55,000 uh, assists with us, enables us to develop our ICE portfolio that consists of, uh, for me, for three main units, administrative services for the headquarters environment, personal property for the entire ICE, and also fleet for the entire ICE. So I, I think it really helps me tremendously with the ICE portfolio for asset management for those three units. Yeah. Eric, so pretty, any? so pretty much, I can echo the same thing. You know, just like, uh, just like um, um, Al manages those things for ICE with the components, the subcomponents of programs within ICE. We do the same thing for the twenty-three components at the department level. So I mean, it, it falls directly in line with those exact same sentiments that uh, that Al put forward. And what, what impediments might be there for implementing ISO 55,000? I know Jim is, Jim's got to uh, come online here. We got him excited once we dive into 55,000. But um, yeah, you know, with, as a enterprise-wide approach, um, the standardization of taxonomy, actually, Eric, you mentioned before with the work that you're doing on DMC Mac to ensure that you have all the same data characterizations to be able to manage the portfolio effectively. Um, yes. I imagine it's one example. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that is one example, but of course, you know, standardization of locations is a, to get the system to talk apples to apples, no matter what system we're listening to. Um, I, I think primarily when I, where I see ISO 55,000 used, not just in personal property management or fleet management, because fleet management is an animal in, uh, of its own. Um, but it, 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 I, I see ISO 55,000 uh, more impacting the facility realm, right? Um, but I, the, the spirit of, of 55,000 is pretty much in everything we do as far as refining our processes, refining our uh, data quality and, and location quality. So the DMC, the map DMC that I mentioned earlier, it actually digs into the standardization of not just assets, but locations, whether you know we're gonna geotag a device uh, for, I mean, not a device, but a location so that we can speak apples to apples when we talk about where the assets are. Uh, you know, you might have uh, 20 employees in a building, each employee has a laptop and, and a phone. So we basically to standardize that process to pull all of that data into to one set. Got it. <clears throat> and I saw Jim, uh, has joined us. Jim, uh, are there some questions or, or thoughts you want to also provide, given you've seen all of the different um, forums and presentations uh, to possibly tie in some concepts uh, into this conversation? 
Exactly. Uh, you know, it's uh, from an ALN perspective and in these uh, events that we've had over the years, you know, we've, we've gone from what is ISO 55,000 to, oh, we might think about that to we're starting to do a little bit of it. And now in very forward looking organizations like Homeland Security and Department of State, we see multiple organizations within those agencies and, uh, and or larger organizations uh, starting to adopt these principles. And actually, as Elle said, actually, you know, say the word certification is interesting. So there's uh, several interesting questions out of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, a couple of them are one is, you know, so uh, what would be the value of certification to an agency or a, a component? And then the second part is, so is there, you know, it's exciting to see at uh, DHS that, you know, all these assets, you know, lots of asset types, although I still haven't heard IT assets, but lots of asset types, you know, are under, under the same management organization. You know, are you seeing synergies across that or, you know, sharing information about ISO 55,000 or, uh, or is it kind of, you know, springing organically uh, within each of those areas? So, so I guess to, to repeat your question, Jim. Um, <laughs> Long-winded, sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, you know, Eric, from the department level, um, you're hearing ISO 55,000 coming up in certain contexts, such as uh, facilities. Um, and then Al, obviously, uh, on, on ICE, uh, starting to implement it uh, within asset management there. Are there other instances that you see it organically creeping up through components? Um, is there a, a larger strategy for adoption? From my opinion, no. Again, I, I think this is to the federal arena, even though it's been around for a while, it's still new. Um, I would say in concept, 55,000 is ingrained in all we do, but I don't think no one has said, we're going to implement ISO 55,000 across the board. I don't think that's been done. I don't think anybody's looked at it as a, as a program or a project or a task to do. Mm -hmm. I think I can best answer that too. Uh, the fact that uh, the asset management division is developing uh, a uh, strategic plan this tied to a five-year plan for uh, developing ISO 55000 and eventually getting a certification. I'm basically on an island by myself right now. And what I'm going to have to do is pull in the rest of the continent with the leadership and say, hey, this is because this is how I'm able to do a, an outstanding, exceptional job with my staff. It's because we've been following these goals and objectives that are outlined in an ISO 55000 format and get them to raise their eyebrow and say, hey, if it works for him, maybe it'll work for the rest of us. So it's going to take some time. And, and Moshe and I have discussed this in the past. It, it, it's not something that's going to uh, happen right away. But I think eventually, uh, once, uh, you know, we uh, I draw that continent into the island, I think we're going to be in a, a much better uh, fashion to build. A, uh, you know, I think once we get maybe one component on board with it, uh, and it won't be across the board, but at least it'll be in, uh, as largely as we can. And then maybe uh, get the uh, highlight and get the leadership involved would be very uh, helpful for uh, developing uh, in federal agencies. Like Eric said, it's been around for some time now, uh, and I think that uh, it's you know it's kind of like uh, in uh, in my logistics uh, uh, time, we've gone through all these different uh, intervals of different types of management techniques and everything, uh, whether it be TQM or, or uh, I can't think of all of them, but that's just an example, you know, and I think that ISO 5500 kind of takes the uh, uh, the cherry on top of the cream on top of the pie, I think is an opportunity uh, for uh, other organizations to take a look at. So I think that that's the main uh, goal is uh, getting something uh, that's beneficial, that's going to work for all the organizations as well, but it will take some time. Yeah, and I see the note from uh, uh, David about uh, how the DHS uh, planning program, budgeting and execution process aligns very closely to the overall ISO management system and model framework. And having, having been in uh, most of the components of, the, of DHS and the headquarters for over a decade, um, 
you know, when ISO 55000 came out, I know uh, I was drawn to it because I saw a lot of the uh, requirements already being uh, implemented by uh, components, right? Risk management, performance management, strategic planning, um, tying, essentially bringing in that the entire planning process, the PPPE process at the component level. So part of it is articulating all of the some of the good work that's being done in the in the way uh, ISO fifty five thousand is constructed, and I think once you know uh, you're able to do that, it will shed light on a lot of the great work that's um, you know uh, being done across the department within components. Um, so hopefully, it makes the lift a little bit lighter and and easier. Yeah, if I could, uh, you know, it. Uh, I think that's the discussion that I see emerging, and that's what I, you know, uh, going to do a little bit in my opening, you know, remarks on the first day, is we think about ISO fifty five thousand and assets, but it's really about asset management activities, and aligning those asset management activities is really what a management system is about. Uh, you know that the uh, you know the assets themselves. I mean, obviously, you know, you have you have systems in place to deal with the assets. It's getting it's coordinating those asset management activities that allows the management system approach to uh, uh, you know bring the value to the organization and achieving the objectives. So I think, uh, in fact, that's one of my recommendations is they start to work on a process of uh, looking at trying to improve ISO 55,000 over the next few years is an increased emphasis on asset management activities. Uh, and there's just, I mean, there's literally thousands, you know, thousands of different asset management activities, depending on what you're talking about. And then uh, sort of circle it back to my earlier question is, so in a big organization, it's really an interesting question is, is there value to have the personal property people and the real the facilities people kind of working from the same plan or is there some, is there a value to a top level plan or does it make sense to deal with them individually? I think is uh, a topic that can be revealed as we go forward. You know, uh, maybe David has something to, to add on that, I don't know. Yeah, David, welcome to the welcome to the panel. And why don't you do a, a quick introduction for those that don't know you? Um, sure. Yeah. Listening. So I I work with uh, Eric quite a bit. Um, I'm on the real property side of the house. So I'm with uh, DHS CRSO's real property office in the headquarters. And um, like like Eric and, and the others were saying that you know as a whole, the department we've got policies and structures out there. So um, the department's PPBE process very much aligns with what you would expect in a, in, in a management system. And I know on the real property side, we're obviously focusing on ISO's recommendation for um, the 55,000 for assets. And we've you know, presented that in a previous uh, presentation. The, the challenge, however, is that if you've got the process, you've got a process where you're developing a plan there's a five-year plan, that goes through a review process, components develop their, their plan. It's called the RAP, the Resource Allocation Plan. That resource allocation plan goes through a program budget review. Program budget review results in a resource allocation decision. Resource allocation decision goes into the OMB justification, which then goes to congressional uh, justification, then goes to appropriation. Those are lined up with the DHS's strategic plan. And there's a, um, a PPBE, are, which is essentially the reporting where you're tying that to the department's um, um, strategic plan and the actual uh, how, how exactly we're measuring the performance. So we've got KPIs that are in the DHS's annual performance plan. So as a whole, the structure is there. That structure very much aligns with ISO 55000, understanding what the, the context is, doing the plan, operation, execution of plan. Um, uh, measuring performance, et cetera. And you got, you got the cycle there built on leadership, roles, responsibilities, support, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so overall, the, the structure is there and the requirements are there broadly. 
when it, what, what the issue is, is a lot of times is actually the execution of such a system on the scope of the programs. And what you're getting to Jim here about the alignment between assets that are personal property and assets that are real property, you know, a lot of it goes down to um, actual systems. And Eric talked a lot about that actual like data systems. You need those data systems to talk. And given the structure of DHS, we're federalized. All we have all the components, and those components have subcomponents, and they have legacy systems. It's it's in principle. I think you know we're we're getting there and we're making progress. But um, the reality is, it's not it's not going to be an overnight thing. We're not going to say you know on the real property side, we've got our manual, we've got our management system manual. We say here's the manual, here's the policy. That's where we're going forward. But the reality is, it's not going to be a, a switch. We're not going to say, okay, we have the answer. It, it's going to take time, um, and we are definitely working towards that in partnership across our lines of business with, with Eric and others. And um, really, the transparency is there. And I know our leader, Tom, always says, you know, we can't necessarily always affect the rate at which we get somewhere, but we are we can affect the direction, and we we've got that direction. Well, sure. Yeah. Excellent additions. Well, um, we, we only have a, a few minutes left. Um, and, and David, to, to one of the things that uh, you mentioned about the wrap process and what we've seen in some cases, uh, you know, the, the component levels, is, I think is a, a good best practice is, is utilizing the wrap process to align initiatives, to risks, to performance, and then justifying the budget and aligning to strategic plan. And then ultimately tying that strategic plan into DHS and bringing it all together, which is uh, a lot of the concepts of ISO 55000. So um, it was a great, a great point. Uh, I know we talked about in, in the first meeting as we kicked off uh, the, the forum, uh, the national asset leadership strategy, and then the development of the SALS, the, uh, the sector uh, asset leadership strategies. And I think the idea uh, for this working group was to you know, see if developing a sector asset leadership strategy, similar to what we did for the NALS, but specific to law enforcement uh, would be beneficial. And of course it wouldn't be at the minutia that uh, probably we would like um, given it's all law enforcement asset management, but just wanted to um, you know, gain your thoughts uh, Eric and, and Al on the, the benefits of a, a sector asset leadership strategy similar to what we did with the NALS. And Jim can, can jump in and add anything if I missed it there. I don't this have is, anything. Yeah, go ahead, Al. Yeah, I just, uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. It's a new term for me, a sector asset leadership strategy. Uh, first time I saw it was uh, yesterday. But I think uh, it needs to, uh, if the, there, there's initiatives that involve uh, analytical streamlining and updating um, the areas like fleet, personal property, administrative services, any type of logistics or even real pro property uh, that it aids in um, developing and improving uh, DHS and ICE uh, policies and mission and uh, financial accounting and things like that. I think if you wrap all that together and there's some type of governance developed uh, that guides the inventory and utilization of our assets, then I would be all for it. And in, and in my opinion, I think, you know, I, I definitely like to be involved up front, but it, it, it will get to a point where we uh, make a determination whether I'm the right person or whether or who is the right person. You know, we would rather bring the people in there that have the right answers or can, can give some quality uh, or bring some value to the to the team. So I, I'll be willing to participate regardless uh, to get the conversation started uh, and bring in who I need to bring in. And I think illuminating all the similarities, uh, you know, unfortunately we didn't have our, our DOJ counterparts here who, were, who uh, were part of the symposium, but, you know, uh, identifying those similarities between the, the DOJ as well as other law enforcement entities, Department of State, right, has law enforcement entities, uh, USDA, um, I think it will be a very beneficial uh, best practice sharing. Oh, and here comes Jim. I have one, one word to share before, before uh, Nick uh, rounds us up. And that's been occurring to me increasingly through this 
uh, you know, the week, the, the sessions, you know, at our event. And that word is structures. We've been calling it a national asset leadership strategy and sector asset leadership success strategies. But I'm starting to think the word structures might actually be a more useful term, or at least a concept we need to uh, involve because it's, it's not like, okay, here, go do it. It's like, oh, here's how you can take Al's information and his insight that he's gained and Eric's and FBI's and say, here's stuff that's common to all of this. So you don't have to start at zero. You can start at 50 or 60 out of 100 and use these structures to get where you're trying to go because we've already been there. Thank you, Jim. Um, I just want to briefly uh, flash up these uh, this kind of uh, organizational men member slide here because without these organizations, the Asset Leadership Network would not be able to put on an event like this. So we just want to make sure to get in a thank you to these organizations and a thank you to all of you panelists and all of you uh, attendees who are out there watching. Um, if you want to uh, you know, hear more about this or have any specific questions that we didn't get to today, feel free to send any of us an email or info at assetleadership.net. You can send your questions there. Uh, and I, I won't end things now. I'll give you panelists a, a chance to have any closing comments or anything going forward. Back to you. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for having me. Uh, I appreciate it and look forward to the next one. Yes, Al, I'd also like to uh, say the same thing. Very uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I hope that today uh, we were able to communicate something uh, that might be useful to the listeners and the ones that are called in and listen to this today. I think there's some uh, value uh, that can be added to each and everyone's organization. So again, thank you. And, and uh, thank you both. Uh, and thanks, David, for, for joining uh, on behalf of Grant Thornton, uh, Public Sector and Asset Management. Uh, thanks for you know, putting this together in the Asset Leadership Network. And it's always a joy to be a part of uh, this working group and it's just a, a great community that does a, a very meaningful mission. Good. And I guess that leaves it to me to say thank you all. And we're, we're you know, our plan, evolving plan for next year is to create more opportunities for get people to get together and use the advantages of this virtual environment that makes it easier for us to get together uh, in ways that uh, you know can help uh, us as individuals and as organizations uh, and looking for those win-win wins uh, that what the Asset Leadership Network is all about. So, and thank you, Moshe, great job. And thanks to Graham Thornton. Thanks everyone.